My name is Luther Johnson and um, the project is called the Maker Lisp Machine, which I'm actually making and selling and trying to get out there in the world. Um, so I'm going to talk about you know, the machine and the dialect of Lisp and why we would want to do something like this. Um, a short biography about me, um, I just retired from microchip last year in April on April 1st and I shipped my first one of these systems on April 1st this year. So it's been about a year in development. Um, it's real, right? It is real. Even though it's on April 1st. Yeah, no, this is not, yeah, this is real. It's here and you can play with it, you can look at it. And um, so I, I did a lot of embedded control over the years and a lot of arithmetic at the low level, floating point, fixed point. But um, I've always been kind of a tourist in the Lisp world. And I first got some exposure to Lisp when I went to school at MIT. And I've always been a fan ever since. So although I haven't really worked and lived in the Lisp world, I am always kind of watching it from outside and thinking, oh, I like that what they're doing there. I like what they're, oh, why are they doing that? And just kind of, and I decided that when I I did want to make the machine I wanted to make. Uh, I thought Lisp would be a ni nice environment to run on it. So um, that's what the talk's about. So um, motivation, this, uh, a couple of different things. Um, I miss the old PCs, DOS, CPM. I miss the immediacy, the directness, the ability to get to the machine, to kind of really direct manipulation. Um, the maker movement has started a few years ago. And there's a very strong retro movement, and, and people are kind of missing, you know, both for the nostalgia, that's where I first learned computing, et cetera, et cetera, and also just the simpler uh, experience where you can, it can just be you and the machine, and you and the language, and I'm solving problems, and I'm getting all my enjoyment from actually solving the problems. You know, that's what I like to do. Programming is fun. You know, it's, it's, it's the fun puzzles to solve. So um, I wanted to make a machine for the kind of system I wanted. And I wanted to make the system that would work well on that kind of a machine. So um, the machine, you know, I'm attempting to have kind of a classic vibe, but we're using modern hardware. Um, we'll take the low power, we'll take the reliability, we'll take the manufacturing um, that, that's available to us now, but the overall architecture can still be simple and we can still kind of just you know, nuts and bolts and get right to the, to the heart of the problem. So, um, you know, a little bit of a joke here. With the right recipe and the right system architecture, we don't need more than 640K. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, we, we can have up to 16 megabytes on this system. Um, and the last comment, I don't really mean to be negative or anything. I'm just saying that um, oftentimes we have to kind of take what we're given in order to be compatible and to be able to talk and work with other systems. So you sort of like, I just want to do this little thing, but I got to take all these pounds and pounds of software and all these systems and I'm always upgrading and I'm always like, just to keep the machine operating, I have to like take updates in hardware and software all the time. But I don't know if that really adds to the quality of the experience. You know, so sometimes a machine that's fit to purpose that can be a high measure of quality. It's like it does just the right thing. It doesn't do any more than I need it to do. It does what I need to do directly and efficiently. And sometimes that's more important than being compatible with every other program, every other machine. And so that's kind of the vibe that I'm going for here. So why Lisp? What's cool about Lisp? Well, everything just kind of fits. Um, you know, working code works everywhere, every time, once you get something. Referential transparency is not just fancy words. It actually has practical application. You take a piece of code, and if it doesn't mutate anything, and if it's like, you know, talking about what it's talking about and nothing else, it will move anywhere and still work. So the other thing that I like about, should I sit down or? No, yeah, you Okay. So um, the other thing I like about Lisp is that the way you get things to work is by actually understanding what your program is doing. <laughs> Rather than just throwing it in there and kind of like testing all sorts of things and connecting it here, there, and doing all this kind of stuff and having a massive test database and you know, you know, servers and farms of running a million tests, it's like you really just have to crack the puzzle. And you, 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 you know, we used to call it desk checking. But you know, you basically just kind of figure out what the, you walk it through in your head, but you can because there are simple rules to follow and you get a good idea of what 
your program is doing and then you kind of psych it out and then, then you have confidence in it. And so that style of workflow is something I always liked. Um, Lisp has very high semantic energy density. And what I mean is that in a very little bit of expression, you can have a lot of leverage, you can get a lot of things done um, very concisely. Uh, concise express expressive power. Um, with closures, continuations, and macros, you can do anything. You know, that's your basis set. And um, I'm not really, what I'm saying is that more, it's not Lisp per se or any particular Lisp. I'm just saying this Lisp family of languages um, centering on these concepts gives you these building blocks that allows you to just, it's, it's ex you know, it's functionally complete. You know, it, it, uh, you can do anything you want to do in the language that you've already got without changing the implementation. And so that's what I mean. It's the, it's the, these families of languages are the smallest and easiest to construct functionally complete systems, in, in my opinion. So some details about MakerLisp itself. Um, the aim is for it to be small, light, and fast. Um, I think it achieves some of those things. Um, it's based on an SCCD virtual machine and um, it has the scheme evaluation model. So it's a LISP one, follows the scheme rules. It's written in portable standard C, C89, C90, C. And of course, there's a very tiny language that's actually implemented by the C implementation, the C system itself. Everything, all the higher level forms are in Lisp functions and macros. Um, the dialect is a blend of common Lisp, Scheme, and C. It has the Scheme evaluation model. It has C numerics and C standard library functions through a foreign function interface. And it has um, common Lisp style low level macros and the primitives have spellings and semantics of common lisp. So we, we don't have set bang, we have set queue, we have car, we have cutter, car of nil is nil, car of nil is not eh, you made a mistake, you know, those kinds of things. Because I like the defaults and I like the, the, the way things kind of fit together. Um, it's just much more convenient and makes your program a little bit more concise. You don't have so many error conditions to, to um, deal with. Um, I hope this is a, a, a list that's very good for small machines. It seems to be pretty good for this small machine. And I'm trying to target vintage embedded makers. And what does that mean? Well, if we have a Venn diagram and we have one circle being the maker movement and one circle being, you know, retro and vintage and one circle being kind of like classic embedded system development, real time control. In the middle there, there's somebody, you know, from all of those camps that might like a machine like this. Um, and the other thing is, this, this machine, um, if, if you're familiar with Forth, or if you are a CPM fan, this machine is based on an, um, an Zilog EZ80. So the Z80 was the classic, you know, Z80 was a follow-on to the, it was kind of a, a work-alike clone of the 8080 from Intel, a bunch of Intel people left and formed Zilog and they created the Z80 which was binary compatible with the 8080 but had a bunch of new instructions and all sorts of interesting add-ons and ran, was cheaper and ran at higher frequency. So it became pretty much the most popular microprocessor in the late 70s microcomputers and it almost got chosen for the IBM PC 68000, also almost got chosen for the IBM PC but it didn't so everything that wasn't Intel 86, you know, did not fare as well as, as Intel did in the IBM PC. Um, but Zilog never stopped making these things and just turned their focus to, you know, industrial control and embedded development and all the students and engineers who loved the Z80 continued to love the Z80 and develop and use it and, and put it into everything. And Zilog has gone through a couple of different changes in ownership but they've never stopped making these things and they kept on coming out with new variants. And this variant of the Z80 is a, called the EZ80. And unlike some of the other ones that had page modes and banking and all sorts of things to get to other address space, 
um, it has a big flat address space. So you can address directly up to 16 megabytes of, of memory and you can have 24-bit integers. Um, so it's a very nice but it also can be completely binary compatible with the original Z80, so you can run that classic software. So I'm making a Lisp-focused machine, but this machine would also be good for someone who wanted to do retro things with Z80 because it's all there in the hardware. And this is just a little bit more details. It's kind of like a cross between a microprocessor and a microcontroller because um, it has microcontroller style peripherals and GPIO and things that will let you, you know, directly touch registers and touch bits and, and wiggle signals. But um, it's got an address bus with external memory and it's like a straight microprocessor as well and uses the classic Intel, Zilog and even Motorola if you want it, um, address buses. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a very flexible machine. Um, so this machine that I've developed is based on this CPU business card. It's exactly the size of a business card. And on it we have um, an SD, micro SD card, a battery for a real-time clock, USB UART connection, so you can use this card all by itself and use the computer as a terminal emulator. Or you have this connector that, to the expansion board and you can snap it down on this I.O. expansion board here and then connect all sorts of peripherals. So in this enclosure here, this laser cut wood enclosure, I've got a USB keyboard, I've got a VGA controller here, a little board here that's doing that, and a USB keyboard controller, and um, the I.O. expansion board. So you can build a, a full computer out of it. So it's, it's kind of flexible, it's modular. Um, so the architecture of the machine, it's kind of like a CPU and terminal system. We don't have bitmap graphics or a memory mapped um, graphic display. It's, it's a CPU and terminal. And, uh, but the terminal emulator is running on a VGA card and that VGA card can support 64 colors of text. It also has limited graphic capability, but I don't have that in the system right now. And I've got code page 437, the, the IBM graphic, extended ASCII graphics characters with the line drawing characters and all those kinds of things. So you can make applications look like classic DOS text applications, which is fun. So you can make your maze game. Yeah, you can make your little Pac-Man with, with the little dot things and, and you have the, the, the border lines and you have the line drawing characters and all that stuff. And I'll demonstrate that later. Um, now, I don't have Pac-Man, but I, have, I, have, I can demonstrate all the characters. So, um, this, this machine, it's running Lisp as its main system, as, as the only thing that's running, but it's also good for a CP, as a target for a CPM, or you can do classic cross-development. Uh, I've got the Zilog debug connector, program debug connector on there. So, you know, the way I develop the system is I treat it like a classic embedded system and I download the flash and, and all that kind of stuff. But once the Lisp system is in there, then I expect most people are just programming in the Lisp environment. Um, so it's not an Arduino. It's not Raspberry Pi. It's not an IoT focused board. It's kind of in between. Um, it's for embedded development in a small kind of like at the Arduino level but it's a much more powerful processor and you've got a much more powerful self-hosted development environment. Instead of having to have a big IDE and like download the flash and then you try it and then you have to like bring it back and you do things in your IDE and you download the flash, you can just do your iterative development right here. You know, you, you have a REPL, you, ha you can just like talk to the machine. And um, that's, so that's the kind of thing I'm trying to build here. Um, some facts about the language. Um, it's, as I said before, it looks pretty much like any other Lisp if, if you sort of ex know what to expect, but some things that are a little different. Um, I don't have strings, I just have symbols. You know, historically, as symbols developed, you know, they got properties and they got all this other stuff tacked onto them. Scheme symbols don't have properties, but common Lisp or Mac Lisp, and when I say Mac Lisp, I mean Project Mac, the original Lisp. Um, they have properties and all these other kinds of things. 
they have a naming convention on what things can be symbol names. And so when, it, when you want to actually represent something and it has characters in the string that could not be in a symbol name, then you need to have a string as a constant in order to express that. But instead of having that, I just have, you can either say I only have strings or I only have symbols or strings are symbols, but I just have symbols and any combination of characters can be in the symbol name, but then there are escapes that you do in the reader so that you don't confuse it. So, you know, the reader needs to know whether or not this is a number, or this is a, you know, this is a symbol, or this is the beginning of a list, or this is a vector, or anything like that. So it makes the classic uh, assumptions about that, but you can escape away out of that and like have any symbol name that you want. So that's that's one thing I've done. Do you have implode and explode? No, I have. A, I, I, this is the next line. So I, you can do cats. Cats is like cons. And car and cutter can work on symbols to, pull, to peel off characters. So you can build your string library out of these elemental functions. And so that's what I do there instead. So a system where they, where they were called char and chitter. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's very similar, very similar. So instead of cons, I have cats, which means concatenate symbols. And car and cutter will work on symbols to peel off characters or to peel off the back part of the symbol name. Um, and then the other thing is, um, I don't have a way to reify or to represent in the language as a manipulable object environments, but instead, um, a continuation contains the stack environment and code frame. And so if you pass uh, a continuation to a val, it means evaluate this expression in the environment contained within this continuation. So when you want to do those kinds of things, you just capture the continuation that you're interested in, and then you evaluate in that environment. So these are just slightly different things that I found more convenient and, and more um, efficient ways of doing things. Um, Low-level macros. So how many of you are familiar with common list low-level macros? Yeah, so you know how powerful they are. And you know that because you can control evaluation, because macros don't evaluate their arguments, so then you can explicitly evaluate in the implementation of the, of the macro you're writing which things get evaluated and how. Um, it gives you all this flexibility. And they're kind of like, they're kind of a bit of a mind puzzle, but it is a very universal program language extension tool, as long as you don't mind the fact that there's no syntax and everything looks like Lisp anyway with, with the parens. But other than, if you accept how the reader works, you essentially have any kind of language parsing that you want. Um, so, as you know, a macro is a Lisp function that is basically creates a Lisp expression from its unevaluated arguments. But then, because it's a macro, that expression gets evaluated in place at the point of, of application of the macro in the environment at the call site. And that's, uh, that's basically how it works, and it, it allows you to do all sorts of things. So all of the higher level control forms, like I have a switch, because I like switch, and I like C, and so I have a, a C-like switch, I have case, I have four, I have while, which is also C-like, with break and continue and all those kinds of things. But all of that stuff um, is done with macros and continuations and, and closures. Um, so um, that's how macros work, and it, they work pretty much like macros in the system work like common list macros. And we have a back quote, and we write macros that look exactly the same. And except around some of the, the um, you have a question? Uh, yeah, like, uh, I assume it's on hygienic by default, just like common list. No, 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 it's not at all like hygienic macros because... Yeah, you said unhygienic. Oh, unhygienic, right, yeah. 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 yeah, it's exactly like common list macros. And then you have to use the same idioms and the same things, you know, like let to a temporary in order to, you know, to avoid collision of names. And you do all the same, all the time-tested workarounds. What type, since, you, since I came up, what type is, it, is your let? Language lexically or dynamically scoped? It's lexically scoped. Um, it's just like Scheme. For a while, I had, I had, I had function objects that were also dynamically scoped, and I, 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 
dynamic scoping can help you solve some problems, but then you realize that you really were just going the wrong way about solving the problem. And, and so I, I, for a little while, for like two years, I had dynamic, um, I, had, I had lambdas, you know, closures. I had functions that did not have a specific environment that were dynamically bound. Uh, dynamic scoping, and then of course there's um, there's macros. So I had all those three things as applicable function objects, and I used them for a while in the implementation of some of the higher level forms. But then I realized I was just doing things wrong, and I just got rid of the dynamic scoping altogether. Uh, sorry, does dynamic scoping have like functions that for variables that are parked in an outer closure? Yeah, um, dynamic scoping means that when you apply the function, you don't pick up the environment from the function object itself. Whatever the environment is, is the environment that, that whatever the environment was at the time you applied the function, that's the environment that gets used. So it could be all over the place. Yeah, ex right. Yeah, all, like they're all special variables. So, um, but. Now I just, I, I got rid of all that. So now I just have a lexical scoping, scheme-like evaluation model. Um, and so uh, the other thing that's part of the macro implementation is that I have a, a slightly different kind of backquote. It's basically like a single level backquote, but with some rules that you can follow that allow you to do what you want to do in a multi-level backquote situation in a way that I think is a little simpler and easier to understand and it was certainly a much smaller implementation. So um, the, the, the full multi-level backquote like in the Alan Bodden article or in Peter Norvig's implementation that's out there and I mean that's an amazing piece of code but it's very large and on my system it was just eating up too much space. So I just couldn't afford to keep all old buggy backquotes. What? You have old buggy embedded backwards. They're not buggy. They're <laughs> you just, it's but got a different rule. Yeah, it's you got to implement the bug away, then yes. Well, it's not, a, it's not really a bug. It's, it's a, just a different way of thinking about it. You use that in combination with a couple of idioms, and you, this is how you get done what you want to get done. So, um, it would be nice if there were maybe like code samples we could see so I could get I will get there, yeah. Actually, I do have some code samples. So, um, um, some other features of the system, um, I have an auto-load facility, which means that you just say the name of the function, and if there happens to be a function name .l on the path somewhere, what happens is that loads in the whole file, and then it reapplies that function with, hopefully, the new definition that happened from loading that file. And so you don't have to manually load things. You can just, you can just you know, call a function, and, and it kind of like loads itself. Um, I have uh, a forget kind of thing, and that means to just expunge something from the top environment. I have another thing called set etop, which I'm going to use for processes in Lisp, which basically uh, cuts, cuts the top environment back to a mark, but then you can hang on to the mark so you can put it back later. And that's basically just so that you can have this kind of tree-like environment kind of thing uh, for different processes. I haven't used that too much, but it's there. Um, I have a utility that expands macros out so that if you, you just say expand and then you give an expression and then, then all the macros that are in that expression all get expanded out so you can see the full um, Lisp code. I have a low level debugger. It's not terribly you know, high leverage, but you can get into functions, set breakpoints, you can trace functions, you can drop into a REPL underneath the debugger and look at variables and change their values. Um, and I have many examples of the language use because all the higher level forms are actually written in the language and it's the best way to, to kind of see how things work. Um, some of the bare metal features, when we say bare metal it means we can get straight to the machine without going through anything else and you can access the machine in your Lisp program. So you have direct access to the machine registers. There's no virtual memory, there's no protection, there's no nothing, you, you know, it's you and the machine. So um, it, it has fast SRAM, zero weight state SRAM. So it's running at 50 megahertz and there's no weight states on the SRAM. And um, it's fairly snappy. Um, and you know, it's not a very, it's a pipeline processor. So it's a modern implementation of a CPU with the classic Z80 um, 
instruction set architecture. Um, but it's not terribly elastic or unpredictable in the way that it performs. You can count clocks, you know. But it is pipelined, it has a short pipeline. What does 60 megabytes of SRAM cost nowadays? I don't know. It costs like one megabyte here cost me like, oh, I don't know, $30, $25, something like that. So I, I would have thought that the price of SRAM would have stayed high. It is pretty high. It depends on the yeah, density. Yeah, well, the, uh, the, like the, four, the one megabyte S, I've got two 512K chips there. Uh -huh. But if I go up to like, you know, four megabyte SRAM chips, those get really, really expensive. So okay. there's the, the trade-off here was like a cost-benefit thing. And one megabyte is enough. Um, uh, it, it's kind of funny how I decided on this processor and then I got the bonus of the Z80 compatibility, but I didn't expect that. So I worked at Microchip and we had MIPS processors there and I've always loved MIPS and I have kind of a long, you know, history with lips, with, with MIPS. And so um, I was just l trying to find the processor that would be just right for this kind of a machine. And I was just going back and forth. It's like this one has that, but that doesn't have that, but it's, you know, it's like that's too expensive and blah, blah, blah. So I said, okay, I'm going to like divorce, divest myself of all biases here and I'm going to do a blind search on DigiKey and I'm going to say I only care about two things. I need to have at least one megabyte of, of RAM and it needs to cost less than ten dollars. And so what came up was two Z80 based processors. One from a company called Rabbit which or now is called Digi International was the Rabbit 3000 processor which was like a Z180, Z280 with all sorts of stuff and then there was this one. And it's like, okay, that solved my problem for me. And bonus, I can run CPM. So um, that's, that's how I chose that. But um, so other features here, um, breaks and errors and events are in interceptable by the Lisp code. Actually, an error in the system just creates a symbol, which is the error message. So the, the result when you have an, an error is that you get a symbol that says, yeah, you shouldn't have done that, but then that's a symbol and you can do whatever you want with it and you can pass it to other things. So when you intercept it or interpose an error handler, then it can just parse that error string and decide what it wants to do with it. Um, it's also very easy to add primitives to the system because it's, it's pretty simple C and there's a very easy place to just drop things in. Um, and there's also a foreign function interface so that code outside the system can be linked in and you can talk to it and it maps Lisp arguments and results to the C arguments and results. And um, so th that's another convenient facility. What C compiler do you use? I use the one that, that is supported by Zilog. So it's, that's a, you know, I thought of different implementation languages, but when you're looking at these microprocessors, you have to take what they've got as far as tools. So Zilog has a pretty decent C89, C90, C compiler, and that's the one I use. Mm -hmm. But this, I also, in the source archive, this stuff is all posted out on the web. And in the source archive, there's also a Linux supported platform option. And then I use any GCC that you, you know, and it all compiles and all works the same. So is, there's one file called lisp.c, which has almost everything. And then there's a little file called platform.c, which has your platform specific implementations of functions. One for Linux is provided right now and one for this machine. But you could modify, you can take the source and port it to other machines if you'd like. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how the innards of the machine works and it is a, a kind of a JIT system, um, but it's a, a, it JITs to threaded code essentially and the, that virtual machine that that threaded code is, is basically like Landon's SECD machine. Although I've adjusted the, the my instructions are not exactly like the instructions in Landon's machine that you can read about in the Wikipedia article. Mine are a little bit, just like moved around a little bit to be more convenient for this. For this. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll get to that in a little while. There's a slide about it, but I'll just say it very simply. Stack, environment, you can either say control, code, command, whatever C word you want, which is basically your instructions in your virtual machine, and then dump. And dump, the dump 
is a list of continuation frames. Or some people, when they're getting more philosophical, say the continuation. Like that whole list of frames is the continuation because it represents where you are in the program. That is like your history and your, your reality of where you are. So with those four root variables, um, that really is the state of the machine. And so what the virtual machine is, is a collection of 20-something C routines that implement things that manipulate the state in that virtual machine. They either modify stack or dump or environment or those kinds of things or go to the next place in the code. So everything is really a list in this machine. So your, your code to be executed is a list of virtual machine instructions. And the dump is a list of continuation frames. And continuation frames are stack, environment, and code. And um, the environment is an association list, is a list of association lists, one for each lexical level where you are in the program. And so that's kind of, everything kind of works the same, using the same fabric, the same primitive manipulations. Um, so how the JIT works is that when you start, you've got this raw lisp. It's lisp that looks like lisp you expect. And the job of the interpreter is to crack that expression open and create enough virtual machine instructions that you can execute until the next time you have to make a decision. Because you need the results of whatever has happened in order to make that decision. So basically like a basic block. You know, you're kind of like go forward and then you, you get enough information that you can make your decision and then you decide which way to go and then you crack that lisp. And I'll, I'll demonstrate that a little later. But um, so the, the, and when you then, these virtual machine instructions are just the address of the C routine that implements them. And in fact, the nil atom, the end of list object, is actually the routine that happens when you get to the end of the list to return from uh, a function. It's the thing that pops the, pops the continuation frame off and takes the result off of this stack and puts it on the new stack or the previous stack and returns. Um, so the VM instructions were chosen to affect evaluation in the SECD machine model most conveniently for the kinds of expressions I was cracking open. Um, and then what happens is once you've done that, those VM instructions get patched into that list. That list was a list of, of symbols, of Lisp symbols. Now it is a list of partially Lisp symbols if we haven't been there in the code yet, or virtual machine instructions that you're going to execute. And so execution is like this. Take something off the C, off the, the code list. Either and well, it's always a virtual machine instruction. It starts as a virtual machine instruction. The virtual machine instruction might be you need to crack this expression. But if it's not you need to crack this expression, it's one of the other ones. And then you run that, and then you eventually reach another, uh, another place in the list where it says you need to crack this next expression. So that's, and then the, when the expressions are cracked, they replace the original Lisp symbols in that list, and now they're there. So also, um, some for performance, simple expressions and macros are inlined. They, they, get, they just get done right here. Things like calling another function, another lambda, or something like that, that is not inlined. And things that, um, you know, the cases under an if or, you know, if then else kind of thing are not inlined. But variable lookups, you know, constant expressions, things like that, they're, they're just done right in line. So that means that you don't have to like be pushing and popping and doing that kind of stuff. So you basically just continue. Go ahead. When I say, I'm sort of like. No, what, what you're doing is actually you're, you have Lisp symbols. You have sim like car, cutter, you know, if, you know, call CC. You have those kinds of things. And they are things to be done in a Lisp program, but you don't know how to do them yet. And so when I say crack, what we do is we replace those symbols with virtual machine instructions that will affect 
the evaluation of that expression. Now, that's not evaluating it yet. So, like, you've cracked it into the, the sequence of virtual machine instructions that will evaluate it when you run it. So you crack it open, you patch it back into the place, now your program still has to... Con instructions so I guess the next thing right you now you execute those things and you just keep now you've got the raw instructions to execute you pull the address you jump there you pull the address you jump there you pull the address you jump there one of these times you're going to pull an address and it's going to be the primitive that says crack the next expression okay. and that's uh, so basically crack just keeps calling all the other things yeah I mean basically when I say crack I mean kind of explode the lisp into small virtual machine instructions. Really like you said, when you have a conditional, you don't want to have to necessarily crack or something that you'll never get to it in it. Well, you don't have enough information to make the decision yet either. No, you could, but the thing is you can't make very good decisions because you don't know the the you don't want to like look up the value of something until you get to that place because the value may change. You know, so you need to really respect the sequentiality and the, the ordering that is implicit in the program so that you don't get different results. Would it be a win, I don't know the processor well enough, to, um, to, to take the threaded code and convert it into copy code? Yeah, no, I, I've, I've written a lot of JITs like that where you basically open code the contents of that routine into a buffer and then you can pass a low-level optimizer over there and do, you know, squeeze out all the extra housekeeping. I've written JITs like that for, inst um, for CPU emulators, mm -hmm. but it's not a win on this processor because, I d number one, I did not want to dedicate or allocate extra memory just to keep that code around. And this processor does not have a penalty on jumps right. uh, like many risk processors do where you know you're keeping the pipeline filled and anytime you have to do any branch or any kind of like you know change of control that kind of like you have a hiccup in the pipeline you have to stop and wait and catch up and then go forward we don't have that problem here so it's it's not quite the same economy and cost benefit trade-off so I didn't choose to do that but the main reason is I didn't want to eat up the memory and then have to manage like what do I use for data memory, what do I use for my code buffer, and like how do I, you know, and then you have to deal with invalidating the code buffer and moving things around. So I decided early on when I was way back when I was choosing the kind of machine I wanted to do for the kind of system I wanted to do, I had kind of a model of this is the kind of JIT, this is the kind of language system I wanted to make, this is the set of techniques I wanted to use for a threaded code um, execution, and then I, I picked all sorts of other parameters that fit with that. So it's not just an accident that the mechanics and the, the cost benefit trade-offs on this processor match that model, I sort of wanted that model. And so I picked yeah. the processor that would benefit the most from that model and would not benefit very much at all from doing other things. And so it, it kind of like, I sort of rigged the game in my own favor. I, it's like, this is the kind of system I want to build. I'm going to pick all the components that fit with this. They'll all be harmonious, but it won't be very good at doing another kind of system. But this is the system I want. So that's kind of, that's kind of why. But you're right, that, that is a very good trade-off on other kinds of processors, especially modern risk processors. Yeah, especially when you, you don't want to mess with generating some new language, you can simply get the pointers in place and see. And well, the, uh, the portability is the other aspect of this. This is like, you know, oh, I don't... It's, it's totally portable to copy the C code you already have. That's true, but then you need to, but then sometimes you need to put kind of like little annotations, a little, yeah. so you need to have to slice and dice. Yeah, well, and I, I've done that before too. And, mm -hmm. But, um, so I, I just chose a different set of techniques. And then I, pit, I picked all the requirements and the parameters in the system that would work well with that set of techniques. Makes sense. So that, that, that's kind of how the, I sort of rigged the game in my own favor. Um, so this is just going through the, the basic root values of a, of a SECD machine. It's a very good article on Wikipedia about it. Um, some historical facts. Um, Peter Landon invented this machine to be able to describe the semantics in Algol 60. So that's what he, but it turns out that it's good for just about any kind of language, block structured or anything else. Computers were to compute. Yeah, but it, it really is a very flexible framework for describing 
how a computer works and it is exactly like the canonical model that you want for implementing a very straightforward Lisp, I think. I think it's exactly the right thing. So, um, any questions about this um, before I leave this slide? You good? Um, now, I follow the rules, but I do list surgery and I do things where the, the effects of the state changes would be the same. So, in some of these primitive operations, you're doing something like take something off of this stack, put it on this stack, so rather than popping and pushing, it's like, wait a minute, I popped that off of there, and now that cell that was holding that, that element of the list is not going to ever be used again, so I can reuse some of that. So I do tricks like that in the implementation. I don't ever co-opt or corrupt the actual state change model of the system. I do things by the book. But within a primitive routine, inside of a C routine, I can affect that any way I want as long as I don't break the rules. And so... So it's the equivalent of milling out stack elements that you're no longer using. That's right. Well, the, the, it's kind of a fact that... It's a funny thing. You know, usually in a garbage collected system, in a system like this, you really can't have much visibility whether something's ever going to be used again. So values... You, you can't just like, you can, it's like if I take this value, somebody may be referencing this value, but the one thing, the one piece of data that you know no one can ever use again is the cell containing that link in the stack list. No one can get to that. No one has actually access in a, in a list program to the stack itself. You know, so there you can, you can play some games. Um, so it does tail call optimization in a very natural way. It's, a, it's really not that hard. It's when you're executing a bunch of expressions, all you have to do is you say, is that the last expression I'm going to execute in this list before I return? If so, don't push a continuation because I'm going to just push it and pop it and then use the, the, the previous one anyway. So just don't push it, you know, and it's just, I'll just, instead of pushing and then calling, I'll just jump, you know. So that's, that's all you need to do and it's very easy to do. Um, I know there's a thing called a delimited continuation, which I think the D is just making it sound fancier. It's a limited continuation. All it is, is, a, is, a, is a prefix of the dump. Execute the dump from here to here instead of here to the end. Uh huh. It's very easy to do. Uh huh. But it's also easy to do this. So, um, so yeah, I. <laughs> it's easier to do nothing. But, but delimited continuations have real virtues because they compose. You, when you call a when you call a uh, an undelimited call C continuation, you never get back. You call a delimited continuation, you go down until the marked point on the mm -hmm. dump, and then... That's the delimiting, I that's guess. That's the delimiting, and then you return back to... Ah. Isn't that nice? I so, suppose so. An undelimited continuation is just a delimited one where the mark is at the very end. I see. Yeah, so I just have the ordinary kind, and you can call up, you can call down. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like the nice thing about the, the cool thing about continuations is returning back into the middle of somewhere that you know, like you were there a long time ago, or maybe you never were even there. But like you know, you can get you can get places. It's and it's not calling. You know, a lot of people use continuations, and I do too. Like set jump long jump, just like accepting out and like just popping out. But you can also like pop back in, and that's really convenient. Um, so. Backtracking and relieving. Um, formatting, formatting data in multiple columns without your formatter have to know about the columns. Uh huh. I use it also for stack, um, for I implementing like a, a scheduler and little, you know, a, you know, a scheduler is in a coroutine relationship with all of its tasks, which just means that they both have each other's continuations and they just apply them back and forth when they want to go back between each other. So I have a little example of how to do that in, in the system. Um, so there's, you know, completely unadulterated continuations. Uh, all the data is on the heap. All values are on the heap. There's no, like, you know, trying to, like, get a little bit more efficiency by having it on the stack. Stack and heap should be equally efficient. It's the same kind of natural operations. Um, and then, as I said before, the, the nil atom is actually the list end routine. And so there's some advantages to doing that. Um, the garbage collector is a classic chainy copying collector with a couple of twists. 
So, um, well, one thing that's convenient is that the reader and some primitives will use the other side of the space while they're operating as just a big buffer. And there's protections in there to make sure that I don't, nothing bad happens. But um, it's kind of generational. It's kind of like a write barrier implementation. What I have is I have the old generation is the top environment. Like the top environment is eternal. Unless you m directly try to take something out of the, you know, I have a forget and you can do surgery. I have primitives to do that. But if you, if you don't, if you define something at the top level, it's going to be there forever until you try to do something. Can you uh, redefine primitives with SEQ? Um, some primitives can be hard primitives, like you know, built-in primitives like car and cutter, cannot be redefined at the top level, but they can be redefined a level down. Like, yeah, they can in the next in the. But no, you cannot redefine because in fact they don't actually exist until they're used. They get materialized um, at the point of use, and they they come from a table, you know, that's built in, and so um, so I don't allow people to redefine hard primitives, what I call hard primitives, built-ins um, at the top level. But of course you can do whatever you want one level down. Um, but the, the trick that's being exploited in this garbage collector is when I was looking at what was going on in, in garbage collection, I saw that almost everything that was happening is I'm copying the, this data and it's just my code. It's like most of the data that's hanging around is the code you've defined. And most of the time in your garbage collecting, like <coughs> when you're running a uh, uh, Lisp expression uh, application program, when you're running Lisp code, you're racing through the stack and most of it's garbage and you're just creating values and you're just like advancing through the stack until you get to the end and you have to do garbage collection and you've got a couple of values that need to hang around which are the results of whatever you've done and everything else is garbage. But <coughs> In a copying collector, you're copying all the things that need to persist, and mostly that was the code. And so here I am spending all my time copying things that haven't changed. And so I said, so that's silly. So what I do instead is the first time you do a, a copy from the top side to the bottom, what I do is I take everything from the top to the bottom, then I note the end of the of the top of the the bottom half, and that becomes the new bottom of the of the of the whole thing, and then I split that in half. So what happens is all the code you've defined gets pulled down to the bottom of memory and you put a barrier there, and then you split the rest of it in two, and then that becomes your two semi-spaces. Now if any, through execution of any of your programs, if anything writes in and mutates what you've saved in your bottom, bottom part where all your code is, then all bets are off. It opens up again and you go back to the same old deal. So what that means is most of the time there's not much to do in garbage collection. You have one or two values that are still persisting. You got all the stuff that's persisting in the bottom but it hasn't changed so it hasn't moved. And your two semi-spaces are mostly garbage, which, which are stack elements that are no longer being used. So this, this becomes efficient because you're basically copying very little most of the time. Um, so a, a right barrier, the right barrier in this case, is the change in the top environment. Um, and so this slide is just talking through the steps that I just talked through. Um, but you really don't have to recollect anything in the eternal top environment and some, until somebody mutates it. Which would be like making a new definition, because so, you're changing the association list. Or if you do replaca or replaca, I have replaca and replaca, so if you happen to be mutating any of those kinds of things that were hung on to, you know, then that would trigger it. And um, then the other thing is, sometimes garbage collectors work like this. They say, I, every time I'm creating a new value, I'm creating a new, new data, I need to check whether or not I need to garbage collect. And they put the check there. But then there's some times where you have to put kind of like a, 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 a barrier around, like this code does not leave 
the, until, you know, from this point to this point, in the middle, this code does not leave the roots in a stable state where one could do garbage collection. So then you have to say, but you can't garbage collect right now. Well, I sort of do it the other way around. So I only garbage collect at points where everything is kind of integral and in good situation. And then the normal code that's actually racing through the heap and creating values is not checking anything. But there is a guard page. And that card page is sized such that there's no expression in my, in, in my Lisp implementation that can, that can create more data than would be covered by the guard page. So I check if I need to garbage collect at the beginning of an expression, at the end of an expression, if I'm calling, I'm doing an apply, I, at these various key boundary points and then in the system I've taken a look at what is the maximum size of data that could be created in all these kinds of things and made the guard page large enough so that it never we never run over and so that way the things that are pushing and creating values they can just blindly advance the heat pointer advance the heat pointer advance the heat pointer and not stop and check no conditionals anything like that and then when you get to that expression the end of the expression, then you can garbage collect. So there's a limit on how, for example, this is one place, there's a limit on how many virtual machine instructions you can execute before you stop to garbage collect. And it's 20. You know, so you can't do, you can't create a, an inlined list of virtual machine instructions greater than 20. Otherwise, I push it down and, and make it go through, you know, pushing a continuation and, and I make it a sub-expression. And so that's how I do it. So that was the choice I made, and it turned out to be a good performance choice. Um, I, I spoke about errors before. You know, control C, for example, is just the symbol control C. <laughs> and that's how you know what it is. Um, I'm going to do interrupts in a very similar way. I don't have interrupts happening right now, but it, it will be done soon. Um, and you can, you can interpose on any, you can catch any error you want. Um, there's a global variable, a special magic variable that called, you know, exception, you know, error continue, star error dash continue star. And when you do that, anytime the system throws an error, it checks if this variable is bound to a continuation. And if it is bound to a continuation, then you call that continuation with the error symbol. And then that thing does whatever it wants. And then it can like redefine the global variable from some list that it has and you can go up the chain. So that's how I've done that. Um, okay, so we were talking a little bit about back quote before. Here's the example of, of how I, I do things. So, you know, when you read, you know, historically, the original quasi quote was written in such a way that people at first did not really understand what the rules of it were, and they thought it was kind of broken, didn't really work right. And I don't know who the programmer was, but he must have had something in mind. Um, but this fellow, Alan Bodden, who was at Brandeis at the time, um, but had probably worked at Project Mac, you know, during this time that he's talking about in the article, um, he psyched out what it was really doing, and he wrote down the rules of what backquote is really doing, and he discovered that the implementation was doing something rational. It was just, you know, kind of a complex thing, and you had to know what it was doing. And then um, he became kind of like the guru of, of low-level macros. But what I, I did something a little different. So I, I considered, and I, you know, the, this system can run the, a full backquote implementation, but it would be really big and more memory than I wanted to, to, to dedicate to this. So I, I took a different approach. I said, okay, let's implement the most efficient single-level backquote possible. And then let's see what it does when you have the multi-level situation. And then let's come up with some rules and some idioms you can use to accomplish what you want to accomplish. And let's see how far that takes me. Um, and you know, because 95% of the time you just need the single level and when you need the, the uh, greater levels, it's complex no matter what you do. Mm -hmm. So um, why not just come up with a set of simple rules? So this is what I've done. So, what happens is, and a back quote is itself a macro, of course. Um, so, what happens is. So it expands to a macro call like scheme as opposed to expanding to. 
random code like colorless? Is that right? Well, um, I don't know what you mean by like scheme. Um, well, in, in scheme, when you say backquote x, uh -huh. that expands to backquote, the word backquote. Oh, sure. That, I have read macros in the system. So the read macros in the system are yeah. unquote, comma, unquote, unquote splicing, comma, at sign, and backquote. And so, yes, of course, the reader turns those things into, reader does the read macros in, in, and turns it into those things right away. Right. Whereas in common, it's undefined what you get. Oh. I'm perfectly happy to translate backquote, left for an A, comma, B into some some combination of consonants. Oh, well, I don't do that. No, it's very direct. Very direct. I mean, back quote is just the back quote macro. And I, I will actually show that to you in a little while. Um, and it's very, very small. So um, what back quote does is it says, I need to do, I need to create this expression so that when this expression is evaluated, it will come up with an expression where all the things that were protected are expressed, expressed literally, and all the things that are unprotected, which means they have some sort of form of unquote in front of them, get evaluated in the environment in which this expression is being evaluated. And so that's, so backquote, like any macro, you know, does that. Um, and so what backquote does in this system is it observes, it actually observes every leading, every leftmost unquote just as if it was part of the, it doesn't care. It's like, back quote is given an, you know, an expression. And it's going to do something with that expression. And it doesn't care if there are other back quotes in the expression. It's just going to take the expression and do its thing. And what its thing is going to be is it's, I'm going to peel off the leftmost unquote and I'm going to allow that to be evaluated when this, because this outermost back quote is a macro, it's going to do its thing and then it's going to let that be evaluated. And so, when you want to nest, in the, in the classic quasi-quote, you have kind of the outside back quote tick matching the innermost, the rightmost comma. And you have to kind of like match those things against each other that way. What I do is every, and this is an example right here at the bottom in that typeface, um, which happens to be a, uh, a piece of code that defines global means defined in the top environment. So at the startup, I capture the top environment and keep it around, keep that continuation around so that people can push things up to the top environment if they want to, which is like a special variable, you know, that kind of a deal. Um, so what this does is it's defining a macro, and this is actually the stub that supports the auto load. It defines a macro that is going to load and apply with that file with that function. So this is part of the auto load facility. But the point here in this example is that f and file are defined outside somewhere and we want to create uh, a definition of f to whatever f is to this stub which is a macro but we want file and f in all places filled in. And then we don't want the unquote splicing on args to be evaluated until the inner one, inner macro actually happens. So the way I do it in this system, when the, the single, the leftmost unquotes are going to get applied right away because that outer back quote is going to make that happen. But at the unquote splicing args, what that first unquote is going to unprotect and do is going to allow that to be evaluated but I put a quote between the two unquotes there which means that when quote unquote at args is evaluated you'll get the string unquote at args which will be what's needed when the inner back quote happens. Now, if you were doing it the other way, I'm just not going to go through the, like, the whole thing because it's boring and tedious. But if you were going to do it in the classic way, you'd have, you'd have um, the file be unquote, quote, unquote, file. You'd have the F be unquote, quote, unquote, F. And then you'd have just unquote, at args. So it's equally complex and equally hard to think through 
but the implementation is huge um, in the classic back quote. So I'm sorry if that was like too tedious and boring, but um, let's get to the performance comparisons. This system is about 30 times slower than C. It's about three times slower than fourth. It's three times faster than Python. Um, I've got some benchmarks that, you know, kind of classic benchmarks, and it compares pretty well with other small systems. It's not as fast as a fully compiled um, Lisp system, but it's faster than most uncompiled Lisp systems. It's about 2x systems that don't have any kind of JIT uh, whatsoever. It's kind of, e if you've ever heard of an implementation called FemtoLisp, um, which is the basis of the Julia language, but you know it was a project in its own right. For and I've studied it and I've looked at it. Th their their JIT is a little different. Um, they basically JIT to x86 code. They do create buffers and small little codelets and, and thunks of x86 code. Um, they d but you know it, so it's a different trade-off, different set of, of 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 choices, and it's about equal performance to the system. I do some things a little faster, they do some things a little faster, but it's, it's kind of in that ballpark. Um, but I think the key thing is Lisp is more like Lisp than Forth or Python. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> so, so that's why I wanted it. Um, we could do some examples or I could show you some pieces of code right now. So give me a moment. Get my glasses on take a look at some things here. Uh. Okay, that's the back quote implementation. And you can't even count the append. That just happens to be the append implementation at the top because I need append. So I had to define it before I did the rest. But there's the one level back quote right there. So um, that's kind of small. And I needed something kind of small. So just to, to show you how much you can do with not very much. And all of those have to be primitive functions that that are not higher level forms that are implemented by macros because I need back quotes to implement macros. So, you know, this is just the, the raw stuff right there. So just not to walk through all of it or anything like that, but just to give you a sense of scale. Um, I had another example I wanted to show you some code. It, it was the thing that I had up a moment ago. If you want to do object-oriented programming in Lisp, it's pretty easy. You don't really need a lot. Um, with a combination, so I've got a, one of the demo programs I've got that comes with the system is a shunting yard algorithm by Dijkstra, you know, that does, you know, uh, an expression evaluator with precedence. And it's a good algorithm and it's kind of interesting in its own right. And it's interesting to read that code to see what this Lisp looks like. And I guess I could show you that in a moment. But I implemented it in two ways. I implemented it in a very traditional kind of straightforward manner. And then I implemented it using the stacks for the operand and for the operator stacks as objects. And so this is my stack object. So what a stack object is, this, this stack function, this stack, all functions are closures, um, this stack closure defines the, this stack, which is its, its stack, and then it defines the methods that you will use to manipulate this particular stack. And, and so you can see the, the last function, f, which gets returned as the result, is the thing that just does a case on which message it was sent. Am I pushing? Am I popping? Am I getting? Uh, otherwise, you know, it's, otherwise it's an error because you didn't give me a method that I, a message that I knew. So when you actually use this in the program, I've just got these simple macros that push of object s and value x is essentially just apply the object, the stack object, with the message of, of push 
to get the push function back so that you can do, use that push function on the value which will then reference this particular stack. So there's, there's your stack level object and I think that's just as concise as any class definition in any other kind of language. You're doing it kind of from whole cloth, understanding how these Lisp things fit together, but you, you know, you can... So I think object-oriented programming in Lisp with, as long as you've got closures and macros, you've got a pretty easy way to go about it. I have a question. I'm, um, I'm trying to see it. Like basically, I notice like pushes in these double quotes. Does that just basically mean the symbol push? Yeah, I mean, I didn't have to do that. I could have done single quote push, because push doesn't have any special characters in it, the reader would have taken that as a symbol name. So the quotes are really for like special characters? Yeah, the quotes are really for if you want to have spaces, or if you want to have numeric digits, or if you want to have other weird characters that the reader would normally interpret as being something else. Like you could have square brackets or open or closed parens in that symbol name inside of the double quotes and it would be okay. I did it as a matter of form just to make it clear, also because I'm using Emacs and it made the color highlighting do that. <laughs> but uh, but um, I, I did it just to be kind of like formal. So if you want to make a symbol name, you can always do single quote, open double quotes, any string of characters, close double quote, and that will be a valid symbol name. You can also do single quote in any number of characters in, that are not white space that doesn't have any of the other special characters and that'll be a valid symbol name. So the double quotes are vertical bars. They don't make the thing self-evaluating. No. Right, okay. Yeah. So vertical bars would be more, would be more lispy. I suppose so. But it's, a, it's more stringy this way. Yeah. So, so it it's kind of highlights that it's... So you know, in other lists, a string is a constant. Um, I don't have strings as constants. I just have symbols, but you can use symbol names yeah. as your strings. Yeah, like MacList. Mm -hmm. Like what? MacList. Yeah, they, 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 had, they probably did not, yeah. <laughs> All right, so um, that's just an, ex an example of... Um, now, I want to just show you... I mean, I have this machine, and we can gather around and do things on the machine a little later, but you can also just turn this thing on and well, let me do this in this right order and use the um, terminal emulator on your computer so I have to stop this because I just disconnected the the board but let me start it again so now that little yellow light means that the USB UART connection is connected on the computer the computer has enumerated the device and it knows that that's a UART now I'm going to start a terminal emulator and I pick the maker list setup and I start that and here we are and so you know I can do but I want to do um, I have a demonstration you know fact zero now I've just auto loaded and executed factorial but let's look at what factorial looks like now yeah, um, yeah I be patient with me. I, I know that this is possible and I always forget how. So hold on a second. A window, appearance, font, font, okay, change. Let's go to 16. Yay! That's almost readable. It's a little. also be invisible in your mouse blocking the colors. Oh. You get black print on white paper like that, isn't it? Um, I can, why don't I can do this, I can actually change the colors right here by executing this little utility that does ANSI sequences and see what happens. So I can do, hang on, okay, is that more, re no, how about, let's, let's go to red. No, that's not better. How about yellow? Oh, okay, well, let me do this then. Color. 11, 3. No, that's not so good. Reverse. Um, uh, hold on. Uh, oh, I, you want... How about... Yeah, um, let me just... Let me, you want black on white? How about color... Uh, 0, 7. How about that? 
Yeah, except in the, yeah, unfortunately, the the putty terminal emulator does not expand all the space characters across like it ought to. But this will be good enough for the example. So um, what you can see there, that is the 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 application object. That is the closure object there. The first number is the is the place that is the environment that will be picked up and used when this thing is applied. Then you have your parameter list, your argument list. Then you have your code. And you can see that the first clause that is if zero predicate of the argument, get zero zero means get argument zero, you know, index zero from lexical level zero, that's your argument. Is it zero? If it's zero, you're going to select the first expression, otherwise you're going to do the second expression. Well, I did fact zero, so only the first one got expanded. So these virtual machine instructions are the virtual machine, get zero zero says, find that thing in the environment and push it on the stack. Then zero predicate says, if it's zero, put a you know, a T on the stack, otherwise put the symbol, you know, T on the stack, otherwise put a nil on the stack. Select says, if the argument is nil, I'm going to do the second thing. If it's, if it's anything other than nil, it'll be true, and I'll do the first one. And so this is what happens when you do fact zero. And notice that the last part of this function says load C and a number, and then the rest, rest of this Lisp expression. Well, that means load C is the primitive that says crack the Lisp expression and replace it in this expression with the virtual machine instruction list. And guess what? 59903 is actually this place right here. So when this executes, whatever it gets from expanding this, that's going to go right here and replace the load C. And then execution will continue at that point. So that's an example of how the, how the JIT system works. So um, let's see, what else do I want to do? Um, well, I have a question. If you, if you do fact again, the first, um, I guess the first, uh, you know, how you have like a number there, that's a number location, right? Is that going to change, or is it always in fact? Well, when it garbage collects, it might change, but all the links will be, con you know, so I could do fact again. Um, and it might change because we might garbage collect. But it didn't because, in fact, we've already settled and gotten it into the eternal top environment in, the, in the cor what I call the corral. So it's already been sequestered into the corral, so it's not going to change again until I redefine fact. So, uh, yeah, sure. No, yeah, no, for sure. I was just about to do that. Okay, and then we look at fact, and we can see the rest of it got expanded. And so, um, so you know, so in some list systems, when you create a, an applicable object, you just get kind of like this hashtag thing, and it's just kind of like a, a token that it identifies that it's not really printable. But I like to have it available here so that people can see it. Because I, I, really, this is not just to be used. I mean, it is also to be kind of learned from and, and explored. And uh, I just find it convenient to be able to see what it's really doing. Because we can now debug it. So for example, I can do debug fact. And what happens is the original fact gets replaced with this debugger primitive that wraps it. And so now when I say fact 1, I've popped into the debugger. And the debugger displays, it breaks at the entry point of the fact function, and it displays what's on the stack, what's in the environment. The association list is n is equal to 1. That's the environment. And I, do, I just print the, local, the, the lowest level environment, the nearest environment. I don't print the whole environment it has access to. And then there's the code, which looks like what it looked like before. And then there's a, something that explains what the dump is. You know? So there's one continuation frame on the dump right now. And now we can single step, or we can step a, a, a so-called basic block at a time. So if I hit S, now we've single stepped. So we got 
the value 1 onto the stack, the environment hasn't changed, but now the next uh, instruction we need to do is zero predicate. So now zero predicate went on the stack and one is not zero, so what the value on the stack is nil, which is false. And now, based on what's on the stack, we're going to select one expression or the other. And we're, gonna ex we're going to not ex select the quote one, we're going to go to the eval C. Eval C means the following is a sub-expression. I need you to push a continuation frame with the return address that I will come back to when I finish this sub-expression. So that's, a, that's what the eval C primitive does. So we'll step again. And now we are at the eval C primitive. And what will happen when I step again is the eval C will execute. It will push. You'll see something happen on the dump. We've pushed a continuation frame. And now we've entered that expression. And now we'll push a 1. And now we'll get n. And now we'll subtract, you know, 1 from 1. And we have a 0. Now this get b, it says get binding. Um, because fact was defined at the top level, I don't have to do a lexical lookup, say, like this index in this lexical level. I know it's at the top. So because it's at the top, I can actually put a pointer to the binding itself in this expression. Because, you know, when it garbage collects, everything will get adjusted and fixed properly. But I can actually put a pointer to the binding itself. Whereas if it was a local variable, a level down, that address of that binding changes every time you re-enter the function because you create, you pick up the old environment and you create a new frame for this ex execution. But if it's in the top, it's always going to be the same um, binding. Although the address changes when you garbage collect, but it's the same binding that you're referencing. So now what this is all about is just looking up the fact symbol and reapplying fact, recursively applying fact. So get b says go to that binding and get the value at that binding and that happens to be the value of fact um, and then apply fact to what's on the stack. And so we step now, now we've entered um, we've entered fact again um, we're about to and fact is defined with this wrapper of the debugger and then we execute that and now we're at the, the execution of fact that is zero and so on and so forth and you can see that a one will go you know we'll select quote one that's quote one we'll push a one on the stack that'll get done but now we've returned now we multiply one times the the value in environment which is the two or is one I did fact one instead of fact zero so it's one times one we multiply and you know now we're going to leave so that's how you can step so it's a low level and you have to kind of understand the SECD machine model to see but you can put breakpoints on functions you can also I'm gonna undebug this function undebug fact, return fact to what it was before, but I'm going to trace fact now. Okay, now we wrap it with all sorts of crazy stuff. Now when I do fact 3, you see every execution of fact with the actual arguments. So I don't have a lot of tools, but I have some. Um, another thing that I'm going to point out here and show another tool is that variadic functions are actually done as macros that successively reapply the dyadic functions of, with base values and so on and so forth in order to get the right answer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I can do... They have special names and I'm going to probably change the special names so that people don't collide with them too easily. So right now they're, they're too generic. I'm going to make them... Especially for things like plus and minus. Yeah, yeah. Like, I've got... And some of the, some of the intermediary macros are called add, sub, mold, divid. And so I'm going to change that because other people are, are sitting down and colliding with it all the time. But, for example, you can do this. Oh, I, I, meant, I meant to do this. 
and you get what you expect. But you can expand that with this macro expand utility. utility. And what you get is that. So that's what's really going on underneath. So you can take any expression and do expand on it, and you can see the raw Lisp code underneath. So these are useful tools. Um, so um, that, let me go back to the presentation for a moment, because I just have a couple more slides, and then we can be done, or we can open it up for anything that you want to talk about. Um, Okay, so uh, I showed you the shunning yard algorithm stuff. Oh, uh, we can go to the machine in just a minute. But I am selling these things. So um, the CPU cards, the, which I was just, this here alone, which allows you to do it on a, on a terminal emulator, um, this is $129. Now, these prices will come down. These prices are based on me being able to only buy batches of 10 or 20 at a time. When I can buy batches of 50 or 100 at a time, the prices will come down at least by a third, maybe 40 percent. So right now they're a little pricey. Um, but of course uh, has the problem that everyone waits until everyone else has bought the first in. Yeah, <laughs> but although, uh, but you know, also 129 doesn't necessarily break the bank. And so if you find it interesting, so right now, there are some people that say, hey, this is kind of interesting. I like this idea. I want to go get in and play with it. And I got the source. I can play, do whatever I want with it. And this is kind of a fun little vehicle. So I'm getting some interest. And I have sold a few systems because people just want to get in and play with it. And, um, and, then, and then in terms of like, you know, putting this in classrooms or something like that, well, we're a ways from that. And I have to develop curricula. And I have to kind of like get you know, more stuff done and make the system more usable. But at that level, then the things will cost like $35, you know, but we're not there yet. So right now we're in the pioneer phase. And everybody will have their own little list machine. Yeah, but right now we're in the pioneering phase where, you know, it's like, this is interesting to me just because I like stuff like this. And so you can sell one to Google New York and they'll put it right next to the symbolics list machine. Yeah, maybe, maybe. So um, this is, this Which is. works, by the way. I, I actually typed, you know, plus three, four into it, and uh -huh. it's seven. Neat. Yeah. Um, oh, these are just like other backup materials in case you had questions about certain things. Like, for example, there's all the virtual machine instructions. There's 24 of them. If I want to put a button on it, and I can press the button, you know? Uh-huh. Can you show or say how I would write that? Um, let me show you the GPIO. Um, yeah. primitives, because I think that'll address what you're asking. And I'll show you the, um, the Blinky program. I'm just going to use Emacs here because it's kind of easy. Um, let's see, USD demo, that is actually the right directory. I want Blinky. Okay, so here's the Blinky program. And it just turns LED off and then delays 5,000 loops and then and delays just a recursive function that recurs until 5,000 is exhausted and then turns LED on and then delays and then calls itself. But what does the LED function look like? The LED function is this. It sets the mode on port A data register it says it sets the mode of GPIO output on port A data register. And this is a real register defined in the Zilog EZ80 manual. And you set, you know, 7 is the bit I'm going to set. I'm going to set bit 7 in this 8 bit register. And I'm going to set it in GPIO output mode. And GP out looks like, uh, GP, oh, GP out is actually in the built-ins for EZ80 and GP out, where is it? Looks like this. And so GP out, you do register bit clear. By the way, register bit clear is also a Lisp function, you know, that just does an AND and an OR, you know, stuff like that. So um, you take all these registers that are referenced off of the base register, which is the data register and you set these these bits and now you've put it into the GPIO output mode. And where is this file system that you're browsing? 
it's on here. It's okay. here. Well, this one right now is actually on the Linux system, the, my image of the file system that I'm, that I'm running Emacs on now. Um, if I pop this SD card out and put it into the computer, I would be looking at the live. I'm looking at an image uh, copy, but on your system, when this, we, we can run it right over here. In fact, it is running right now. All of these files that I'm showing you now are on that SD card, which is a copy of this one, okay, on FAT32. FAT yeah, it's yeah. running FAT32. Okay. Um, so I'm showing you what it really does look like. That whole layout, uh, like, uh, let me show you this. Uh, SD. Here's what the file system looks like. You've got some utilities in bin. You've got some demo programs in demo. You've got one file in etc., which is actually the ROM image. Um, there's, a, there's a flash update utility on the system in bin, and you can actually take updates to the flash from my source archive on the internet, copy them onto your SD card, run the flash update utility, and update the flash right here. So um, I programmed with the Zilog tools originally, but um, so, um, so only compiled C code lives in the ROM? Only compiled C code lives in ROM. Okay. Everything there's, else there's is on this SD card. What? There's no compiling lives to ROM then, if it makes sense. No, no. Yeah, okay. Not right now. I mean, it just wasn't the trade-off I chose. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then you have the built-in list. These are like the built-in things that, these files you can add anytime you want. Well, actually, you can do anything you want with any of the files, but these ones are kind of like the basic language support. So you've got your C library definitions, which are basically prototypes that allow you to, to marshal parameters and get across the function foreign, foreign function interface. You've got easy 80 based register definitions. You've got language elements. So all of the higher level things like, you know, these are all just macros that compose all the things as you would expect them to do. And I've got, you know, all the variadic support and the, you know, the, all the nary and all the order nary, <laughs> uh, all that. These that's, are all in bin, right? These these are in L Lang right now, okay. but this whole archive is up there on the web. You can spe you can spelunk it. So, uh, the auto loads, right? Um, if you have subdirectories or something, what if you have two things with the same name but in different directories? The w first one on the path that it finds will be taken. Okay. So there's a path that it searches. Mm -hmm. So when it tries to do auto load, it first searches the path and finds the first dot L that matches the function name that you, that you said. And then what it does is it creates a stub that causes this auto load to happen when you actually implement it. So that happens at the symbol lookup time. So it, when you look up a symbol, if it isn't found in the environment, you then see if it might be something that you would auto load and so then it starts searching the path and looks for a symbol name dot L. If it finds a symbol name dot L, it defines that symbol to have the value of the stub so that when you later, like a second later, actually try to apply the value of that symbol, it causes the loading thing to happen and then it reapplies the thing so it all kind of works. All of that definition is in the util directory so auto loading is done by Lisp. Yeah, it's all done by Lisp. So it, I can show it to you right here. It's in the util directory, and it's in the load function, load file. And so the evaluator creates the stub by itself. I've also got macros here that you can manually create these stubs. But the evaluator, when it fails to find the value of a symbol in the environment, fabricates the stub and creates the value in the environment of that stub, but that stub references these functions. Mm -hmm. And so all of that stuff is happening in Lisp. Yeah. What numbers do you have besides 24 bit I have doubles. That's what I have. I have C numerics, essentially. Well, but, but without flow. No, doubles, floats. Oh, double. Yeah. C doubles. C doubles. C doubles. Okay, cool. So that's what, what, what you have. And they're sticky, too. So if you combine, if the, all of the arithmetic functions will take either integers or floating point numbers, and the floating point numbers are sticky. So when you combine a, an integer with floating point number, you get a floating point result. Mm -hmm. What's the native word size? Mm -hmm. What's the native word size? 
the native what size? Word size, Word size is well, 24 bits in this mode. Yeah. Um, so, so that is the value that Zilog chose. That was the trade-off that they wanted to be bigger than 16 bits and less than 32. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they just they they made that trade-off. They thought like 16 megabytes. Well, at 286, you can get to 16 megabytes. Okay. You know. It's not like there's an no, no, there's no segmentation in this processor. It's flat. It's just, they just chose 24 instead of 32. It was a matter of economy and cost benefit and, you know, paths all have to get wider and like, you know, eats up more silicon and they said 24 is what we want. So that's what they did. So these are regular 64-bit IEEE floats or there's some other kind of floats? No, they should be, you know, I'm going to, I believe that they are IEEE 64-bit double floats, although some implementations of intrinsics and C compilers will call doubles singles. We'll, we'll call, we'll, you can say double in the language and unless you say long double, you, you'll get the single and they have those defaults there. But um, they ought... I'm just curious how that fits with the 24-bit. Uh, oh, it doesn't fit at all because okay. you're doing everything in memory and you're just laying these things out and you've got like software that's actually doing these operations. So, yeah, they're they're in software. They're gonna what? No, it doesn't trap. It's the C intrinsics are just calls. So you you know they'll do they'll probably do some things like you know changing the sign or doing you know loading a constant in line but the c compiler in most cases is just going to call offline to a an ieee intrinsic routine to do you know in memory it's you know, trapping without trap instructions yeah it's yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, right it's going offline for sure um, but uh, a note about that so i did a lot of floating point work on the microchip c compilers and Unfortunately, the Zilog C compiler needs some work too. So I am going to be improving the intrinsic floating point support as well as the math library, math.h support, um, just because I need it to be better for this system. So for example, when you do one divided by zero, you ought to get inf and you get nan. You know, it's like some of the boundary cases are done, just done wrong by their C library. Um, and they, uh, I noticed, I noticed that uh, one of the rounding, you know, sometimes the rounding doesn't like round exactly the way it's supposed to according to the IEEE rules. So I'll be fixing all that. But right now it's kind of, it's kind of, w I, you get what you get with the Zilog C library and, until I fix it. Um, but the intention is that they should be IEEE 64-bit doubles. And if they're taking shortcuts somewhere, I'll fix it. But I, I know how to do that. I did that for microchips, so uh, we're good. But it, you know, everything in order. It's like have to, I have a lot of things to do, and one of the things I need to do is I is expand the utilities so that this is a, a usable self-hosted system. So, for example, unfortunately, there's no self-hosted editor right now. So the way you edit is you pop the SD card out and you put it in your computer. You edit and you put pop the SD card back in. But in a couple of weeks, I'll have a simple editor. You know, so I have LS and I have CD and. That's bigger than it seems. <laughs> that. But, but I suppose you could write a C compiler in, 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 the, in the list. I, I could, but that's a long way around. Yeah. So, to, to get. So I have customers now. I have people actually using these things. So they need an editor now. So in a couple of weeks, I'll have an editor as part of the distribution. What's the license in the Zilog C editor? Um, well, I can use it without paying them any money. Um, I'm not distributing the source of the C library, though. So, so what's the what's yeah, the basis so of your question? I'm, I'm wondering uh, if the software can be considered free. No, no, the Zilog C library is not free. It's binary and it can be included in my product, but I'm not allowed to, without permission from them, 
disclose or distribute their source. Although when you buy the Zilog tools, actually you don't even have to buy, you can download the tools, you can get the source. So the source is freely downloadable, but I cannot distribute it. So you can go to their site and you can copy their source for the C library and you can use it any way you want, but I don't have the rights to make an archive and post it on my site. You're going to resume it, so it's not free. So it's they, not free. It's not free. They want to be the ones that distribute it. Free they want to be the ones distributing it's it. It's so close to being a free, which is a complete free computer. Yeah. I think. Well, all my all the stuff I've put up there is all MIT licensed. You can do whatever you want with Aside it. Aside from the C library, is there anything else proprietary? No. Well, the classic approach there is just in your build process, download the thing. Well, no, no, but because then you can get it certified by NSF as respect for freedom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think we'll probably address all that. In fact, if you I, rewrite the C library, then. Yeah, I'm, the parts that I rewrite, of course, will be free. And then maybe you'll be done, maybe you'll find it rewriting all of it. Well, the, there's a nice open source implementation called Muscle that yeah. we might use. And I used that at a, at a couple of other previous lives. Um, so I might take the muscle stuff instead and then adapt it to this and then, then we'd be f completely I think it'd free. Be so cool if this was fully free. System. Yeah, so that is the one place it's like you can I can point you at the Zilog site and you can go get it yourself and then you can apply this patch that I'll pr give you to patch it and we can do those kinds of games. But I, I'm not I don't have the rights right now to put but, my own archive up there. But Eventually, maybe, maybe you rewrite it all. Possibly, or maybe like start with muscle and rewrite the parts I want to put in, and then it's a muscle, it's a custom muscle distribution. So, something like that. Um, I think we will get to all those kinds of things. And anybody who wants to help, I'm happy to hear it. So, um, you know. And then once you get there, you should, you should get it approved by FSF as respect for people. Yeah. I, why not? You know. Well, if it's only the MIT license, at least not. I mean, what's the license of muscle? Muscle, I don't know, but it's a pretty open one. Yeah, okay. it's, it's a pretty. Yeah, it's like I think it's Berkeley, maybe. I'm, I don't know. It's one of the open ones. Right. So. Um, yeah, no. um, but I'm, you know, my email is info at makerlist.com. I'm happy for you guys to talk to me about that and make suggestions. I'm wide open to change the licenses. Uh, I just started with the MIT license because some of the code that I was already using was also MIT licensed. So I thought, well, let's just do it all. So I just said, let's go. Right, it's small, and then I don't have to have two different kinds of licenses because I was already using some MIT license code. So I thought, why don't I just make it? Make the legal code longer than the programming code. Right, right. So, um, so uh, I, have, I have a question. It's kind of out of left field, but sure. I just figured you're the only expert in the um, So, uh, you know, there's been a lot of uh, hype, and I, I wouldn't say hype, but uh, excitement about uh, Risk V, mm -hmm. um, which is an open source ISA. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you were to imagine, like, one of the good things about it is that you can actually also have your own instructions on top of the standard. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you were to like say design your own say instead of by using Zilog, design your own CPU, based on what you're doing here, do you have any um, ideas of what kinds of instructions that would be specific to this that would make it a lot easier to uh, implement this? Well, I don't know. I I I I feel two ways about those kinds of things. It is often thought that mapping language features onto hardware gets you somewhere. But it really doesn't because you have, at the end of the day, the same natural operations that you need to do. And so any decent conventional microprocessor instruction set architecture that lets you get to just this operation and not bring in a whole bunch of others ones at the same time will suffice and you'll get, you know, if it's got the right level of granularity and orthogonality or separation that it lets you do the essential operations you want and no more, that's good enough. Yeah. Um, getting, getting your own silicon to run really fast is something you want to outsource. Mm -hmm. you possibly can, which is why Intel and Zilog and stuff so make a living. I, I, <laughs> I doubt that there would be much of a win from putting a special instruction in um, that either bound together two operations or 
um, and with risk and with pipeline, binding two dissimilar operations together doesn't really add, doesn't give you anything. Um, it's possible, you know, I think, I think sometimes that like things that would like automate, you know, the right barrier checking or something like that or some, anything that could be done concurrently, not in the instruction stream that could be a concurrent check. But at the end of the day, like the, when you bake something into an instruction, then you're committed to that algorithm, you know, to, to a certain degree. And it's, um, I would be surprised if there was so something that helped me much. Using well, I mean, hardware floating point always helps, you know, so I mean, <laughs> having, a, having a processor that does the arithmetic you want, that definitely helps. So, I mean, I don't have that, you know, so a floating point unit would be nice. Um, other than that, um, I, I don't know. I mean, the Risk Five looks like a nice risk process. It's basically like open source MIPS, basically. Yeah, you know, it's it's pretty close to MIPS. It's slightly different six stage pipeline instead of five or eight or any of the other implementations. But it looks nice. I mean, I, I but I chose this one because it was available and because it was less than ten dollars, and I could have an external address bus to get out to memory, and that that really was all of it. And I'm not, I haven't done any assembly language. It's Sol and C. I mean, I'm capable of doing assembly language, but I haven't had the need yet to do anything. How are the different dynamic, uh, dynamically typed objects distinguished internally? Oh, so the cell, I can show you the cell definition. Yeah. The, 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 the union, which is all things. Um, okay, so it's a union of all things. Yeah. Just and okay. you, the first element in the cell, is if it's a pair, it's the address of the first, I, uh, first value, the first half of the cell. Mm -hmm. If it's not an address, then it's a distinguished value that's it's minus one, minus two, minus three. It's one of the, one of the atom types. Everything is either a pair or an atom, right? Class so, gotcha. yeah, it's very simple. Um, but I'll, I'll, let me just grab that. Um, let's see, source, lisp, lisp.c. Data cell definition. There it is. That's that's everything there is. So it's either a pair, or it's one of these other kinds of atoms. Um, so you know, it's either a, it's either um, an integer. Um, you know, it's, it's an integer type, which is an address sized integer that's signed, so that's what pointer diff t is. Or it's a double, which is a floating point number. Or it's, um, let's see, or it's, uh, what, is, what am I using L for? I can't remember from right now. Um, or it's the length in a symbol. Um, or it's, um, you know, the the second part is like the, the back part of the cell, the cutter part of the cell, or the A is for, can't remember right now. You've got, a, you've got vectors there. Um, oh, A is for, uh, I'll have to look that up. I, it's been a while since I wrote this code, but here's a, here's a continuation frame. Here's a vector. This is the, 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 so the cells are organized like this. The first part is always the thing that distinguishes what type of thing it is, which might be a car, you know, the first half of a pair, or it might be a, a, a type um, distinct de determining um, value. Uh, and then the second part is the data, which is either like an address here, or, um, or a vector, or um, a continuation. Um, you know, a, a, a continuation frame, and these are part of data in the, the union data. And what is A? I'll have to look for that. And what's the forwarding pointer for? Is that the oh, that's because you're copying a uh, copying collector. That's the yeah. so the, the way you copy when you're going from one side to the other is 
you move and you leave a note on the front door. <laughs> it says <laughs> the forwarding address. Yeah. So originally when you create a value, the forwarding address and the address of the, the cell are the same. But then when you copy it to the other side, you make the forwarding address point to the value on the other side so that if you reach that value on the first side again you can see that it's already been copied and doesn't need to be copied again. I'm just surprised that forward is not another union possibility. Uh, well no it's a it's an essential part of the cell I, it doesn't need to be ever because accessed. Once, you, once, you've, once you've gone to a forwarding pointer you don't care about any of this anymore as a um, I don't know what you mean by that. Um, uh, you, 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 are tr you are chasing a pointer, you see that the thing has a forwarding pointer, so you go to the other side of the... Of the well, you, know, you avoid copying is what, what you do. So, in other words, when you're copying... So, okay, the Cheney copying collector is breadth first search, mm -hmm. and you have a scan pointer, and so what you're, you're, you, the game is you're going to copy a route, or you're going to copy a value across, and then you want to chase it, so you extend the heap, and then you want to chase it with the scan pointer. And so what is, you take the, the contents of whatever value you copied, and you have to copy those things too. So as you copy those things, those advance the heap pointer, and as you ha have finished those things, and you've, af after you've copied everything in the interior of a cell, you can advance the scan pointer. I'm done. That one's been across. Right. So At that point, you change it to a forwarding pointer. No, 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 no. no um, the forwarding pointer gets created when you make the new value on the other side. Oh, right. So okay. what the 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 primitive that makes a value is also the primitive that's used when I'm copying a value. So to copy a value from one side to the other, you actually make a new value on the other side with the arguments of the interior parts of this, and so that causes these things to have the the value to the um, to the, you mark the forwarding pointer here with the with a new value here. So it's because of the bread first search that you you're, you're shallow copying these objects and therefore they have to refer to the same things. That right. So when I when I now go to inspect the interior of a new thing that I'm trying to fill out and make sure is on the other side. I first check and see if the forwarding pointer is already pointing to in that thing is already pointing to the other side therefore I don't need to make a new value on the other side and copy it. So that's yeah. so forward is a little different and it's not it's not used by anything other than garbage collection. So uh, the data cell has an identifying part it has a forward pointer, it has an identifying part which is the type and then it has a data part. And I think, um, I'm trying to remember what A is, um, I'll, I'll find it here, but uh, make pair, I'll get back to you on that. This is why we're allowed to have names with more than one character. Yeah, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, I think that that's basically struct D cell pointer A. I'm going to have to look that up. Oh, well, let's see. Wait, ho hold on a second. No, that's just the car part. That's all that is. That's just the car part. You either an integer or a double or um, or a size or the car part. No, the car part would be here. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't remember right now. I'll have to look. Okay, um, we're, we're pretty much yeah, done. We're pretty close to, now, um, I have a room here till 9.30, so mm -hmm. um, we can continue the discussion and more importantly, have a chance to look at the hardware. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to thank Luther um, for uh, coming here and showing us this amazing, actually this is a really amazing project. Um, and I also want to thank all of you for uh, coming. Um, and uh, I think that's about it, except we'll go to a bar, there's a bar right on the, I, it looks like it's raining outside, so there's a bar right on the corner going uptown when we get out of the entrance. Um, I'll, I'll get the name, uh, but 
we'll go there afterwards. So after, after this, we'll still have a chance to uh, talk to Luther. He's decided to come out with us. Yeah. Um, okay, so if you want to see, this is the machine over here. And it's running the Blinky demo. And here's the CPU card that's just been snapped down on this IO expander card. And here's a VGA controller, here's a USB keyboard controller, and a GPIO is being pulsed to fire an LED there. And I've got, you know, a particular color on now, but I can change the color. Now this is a little 40% keyboard, so you need to use compose keys to get to some of these these numbers, numbers and F keys. Yeah. So, um, and now I'm just running. Now, there's a little bit of a lag when you start up because what happens is I have to get the things off the SD card. And the SD card is the slowest part of the system. But the, the jitting actually goes pretty fast. But taking the files and loading them in off of the SD card, and that's something I'm going to improve the performance of. Do something to, to attach a larger yeah, device? Yeah, sure. Device. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, there's no, no reason I can't. I'm using SPI. So I could use, and the SPI has a, I can do about one megabyte per second. Do you bit bank um, so some, do you bit bank? No, there's an SPI controller in the EZ80, so it's pretty efficient SPI controller. Okay. So it's, it's doing SPI, but the SD card itself is a little slow. And the, the, the channel has a, the other thing is I'm, I'm only using single sector reads right now. If I do multiple sector reads, that'll speed up the SPI read performance quite a bit. Yeah, so I have to do that. The, the, the card is a floppy disk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is, is there some reference design you followed for the card? No, I, that's our design. It's my design. Um, I mean, I hired a couple of other engineers yeah. uh, that did ca the 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 CAD layout kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I, I did a lot of the design at the schematic level, but other people did design too. Mm -hmm. So I, I I've had a couple of other engineers work with me, but this is this design belongs to the world now. I could say it belongs to me. I paid for it, but it's all out there. So, um, what wood are you using? Hmm? What wood? What wood? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's whatever. It's know what wood well, it looks like, I think like this birch is, to me. I don't know. Okay. No, it's, it's well, nice. Said it's standard birch. I don't know. It like I think it's like birch plywood. It, I, I mean, it might be pine. The, you should sell the, you know, the, the seven hundred dollars. Well, then there's an oak a mahogany version. Yeah. yeah. So what's mahogany version? Well, actually, nice I have thought of that. I have. Right. There's a there's a craftsman who makes these nice bowls and things like that. I'm, I'm thinking of asking him to do this, but this is pine or ash or something. I don't know what it is. Yeah. So. That's great. And this is a, a, it, I, I thought I saw a great out reference to the to the maker list reference. Oh, I know. So there's a definition of the language. There is a little bit, but it's not complete yet. But you have a list of all all the functions and a little bit of some notes about how the reader is different. And I'm going to be in, improving that, you know. But it's just a work in progress. So there is a, a reference manual there, but it's it's kind of thin right yeah, I now. I love doing emulations at the language level. So, uh huh. You know, how can we try? take this and translate it to scheme, mm -hmm. you know, that will just run on random schemes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you could. I mean, there's nothing here that is hard to implement in any other language. I was just language. about a, a, uh, a project that takes a subset of Python and translates it directly to Dalvik bytecodes. Uh -huh. I think it's pretty good. Nice. Very, okay. very nice. It, it, it's it's just exactly what I grew up on. Do you have? Yeah. Oh. Do you have a? Um, you want to send me an email? Um, with you have my business card, right? Uh, I don't. Oh. Let me give you another one. There's there's 
these would be the business cards. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. For more information. There's others on the table there, but um, send me an email and I will answer your question because it bothers me that I didn't know it off the top of my head. Which one? So what, what am I using that one data field for? Which, which type? I think it's for symbols, but I'm not sure. I want to also try to convince you, and I'll do it by email, but I want to try to convince you that you should support, um, that you should support explicit renaming scheme macros, low-level uh -huh. low macros. The, the, the problem with kind of style hygiene